Hello, hello. Uh, I am Dylan Gu. I'm the founder of Dylan Gu Studios. Um, you guys already know that because it's pretty obvious. But uh, we do have a YouTube channel for those of you guys who don't know. Uh, uh, we post on that channel a bunch of animations that we do. And uh, we have currently over 100 million views and a million subscribers. So we really enjoy doing what we do and pushing the boundaries on animation uh, when we make stuff. So this is just a quick preview. Uh, this is a showreel that we did of some stuff that we did recently uh, with the studio over the past year and a half or two years or so. Um, we're really trying to push NPR specifically. So that's what this talk is about. Anime and NPR uh, in Blender, in CG, being able to really find a way to get that 2D feel in 3D as much as possible. So uh, I think our stuff is pretty cool. Huge props to the team. Uh, I really believe in our team being something special. So I hope you guys like what you see. Um, so uh, what makes NPR look good in CG? There are two main elements, a couple more, but the two main ones are characters and environments. Um, characters are the main thing that clocks 3D almost immediately for most people. Uh, that's why getting the characters right was a huge priority. So, as you can see here, this is a model by Ruki Curry, who is a fantastic modeler and artist. She's also on our team, and she made this model, Callisto, which is actually available for you to download for, um, for free, I believe, for BNPR's uh, fundraiser. But this is a test animation that I did to see if we could really push that 2D boundary with characters. And I think we did a pretty good job. She's incredibly talented. I did a little bit, and that worked out. Um, and then we have, of course, environments. So environments are something that uh, a lot of anime actually uses already, but again, you can kind of tell it's CG. So we want to try to push that boundary a bit more and make it as convincing as possible. So we have been developing a lot of custom tech. If you were here for the talk yesterday, we have a custom build of Blender that focuses specifically on NPR features. Um, this, of course, is mostly an EV, uh, and we can talk more about it in a bit. But what you see here is only possible with uh, the, the Goo Blender build. This is actually technically in viewport. This is rendered, but it looks the same in viewport, uh, which is really, really cool. Real time, it's beautiful. So huge props to the team there as well. So um, how did we get here? Where did we start? Um, this is definitely a culmination of years of research and work um, and talent. And uh, at the beginning, we had this. This was actually a uh, film I made for, um, well, actually, it, was, it won a Suzanne Award for, uh, six years ago, uh, so that was cool. But this was my very first NPR project that I ever did. It's a very simple project, very simple characters, and this is like the first tune shader I made and stuff like that. And it kind of works, but at the same time, you know, you can tell it's 3D, you can tell it's sort of amateur, it's got this sort of blobby shadow that gives away the geometry, stuff like that. These are things that you have to think about when you start doing NPR. Uh, this <laughs> is my, uh, the project that I never wanted anyone to see. Um, I, uh, it's cursed, I hate it, and yes, that is naked Santa Claus. Um, so uh, he's also a bodybuilder and a Jedi, but that's not important. Um, so this project was a, a terrible, terrible um, experience because I thought I could do some NPR stuff with humans and uh, with a simple tune shader on uh, a muscular man uh, I got a base model and I put a tune shader on it and I was like, you know what, that's gonna look uh, good. Um, so I posted that online for some reason. And then um, I realized that there's a lot more to NPR than just tune shaders and getting some pretty lights or whatever onto it. Um, and so we started researching and trying to figure out exactly how do we get NPR to look good? How do we get it to look like 2D? Um, not like 3D with a tune shader on it, but actually like 2D as much as possible. We do like aspects of 3D, but here we are two years later trying to figure out a good balance between the two. Um, and a big part of that is finding amazing talent. I think honestly our team is a culmination of some of the brightest and best Blender users and uh, artists who understand this style in particular uh, in the community, which I'm very proud of them and their work. So after about two years of research, we've been working together on some uh, secret projects uh, some stuff that uh, we haven't shown yet, uh, trying to get as convincing of a style as possible. And we have this. This is a project that I'm debuting here today for the first time. It's just a minute long film. Uh, and it's just a proof of concept to see if it can look good, if we can get characters to look good. Uh, enjoy. Malware detected. 
Quarantine failed. Deploy antivirus protocol. Virus attack pattern successfully duplicated. Antivirus protocol fully engaged. Executing malware threat. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very proud of the team and what we accomplished. This was actually finished up yesterday. Um, so, <laughs> huge round of applause to them as well. Um, yes, yes, please, please do. Yeah, so this was a proof of concept, trying to figure out if we can get the characters to be convincingly 2D, even with a little bit of 3D elements. We don't have limited frame rates. Uh, we have a lot of dynamic camera movements, which we enjoy as 3D animators. And trying to find a balance between that uh, and getting that 2D aesthetic was a challenge. But I think we did a pretty good job. I think uh, the character model looks fantastic. The animation really lets the character model shine, and the effects are something that are uh, honestly out of this world. So um, yeah, so that's uh, a proof of concept that we did. And uh, the question is, how do we get from uh, naked Santa <laughs> to this girl? Her name is Emily. Um, she looks amazing. I mean, just look at that fr a still frame. I think it's fantastic. So. Ruki Curry is a big aspect of that. I think it'd be a lie to say that she didn't have a huge role to play in how convincing the aesthetic looks. She is on Twitter. If you, if you haven't followed her, you should. Um, she does a very good job at understanding how uh, to get 3D to look like 2D. Uh, as a 2D artist and a 3D artist, she's able to combine those two worlds in a very convincing way. And um, I have a lot to owe for her, and she's been working with us for the past two years as well. So huge round of applause for her. She's been working really hard on this as, as well. So what does she do? She does a modeling, of course, but she's not just a character modeler. She's a character expert. So she changes that to this. So normals are a big thing. Um, normals are the reason why a lot of geometry with tune shaders don't work. You have to have a way to edit the normals to make them look less blobby, like that. So the blobbiness is something that geometry tends to have uh, an effect on the shading and the shadows that gives away that it's 3D. So the way you do, uh, the way you essentially convince people that it's not 3D is you remove the information of the geometry. You take out the normals and you say, I'm going to replace these normals with other normals that don't actually exist. Um, and it sort of approximates what a 2D artist would do. Um, you simplify a lot of things. You imply a lot of shapes. You don't actually draw the shapes themselves. So that's a huge help and I think a big part of why the characters look more convincing and a lot flatter, a lot less blobby is what I like to call it. Um, another thing that we do is line art. This is a big, big thing for characters. Getting proper line art and convincing line art is extremely difficult. Um, you can see the normals here as well, but you can also tell that there's a line art pass on Emily here. Uh, and this is done with grease pencil, but it's done through the line art modifier. So it's fully automated. It's using an algorithm to generate the lines, but of course there's a lot of tweaking in the settings and you have to make sure you have the geometry capable of supporting that line art. However, once it's set up, it works from all angles. And the line art modifier in particular, I have a huge shout out for Yiming Liu, who's been working on it. Um, it was originally called LAMPR, if you guys know that name instead. But the line art modifier for the grease pencil uh, is a game changer. Uh, we originally used Freestyle, but uh, that one has a lot of great features. The line art modifier has all those features plus intersections, which is huge because it hides clipping. And I hate clipping. So <laughs> that's a good thing. But also, because it's grease pencil, it has this amazing benefit of being able to be baked onto keyframes. So you have this dynamic real-time, technically real-time in the viewport, line art 
that you can then bake down into keyframes as a grease pencil animation, essentially. And you can fix the line art in the viewport as you go. If there's any errors, if there's any sort of stray lines, you can just go directly in there, draw some new lines, erase some lines, and clean it up. That is incredibly more efficient than having to export a separate pass into After Effects and masking it and stuff like that, especially with the fact that you don't have to worry about anti-aliasing because it's all rendered through the same pass in the end anyway. So this is an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, I have a lot to thank for this because I, I think it's incredibly useful for what we need it for, which is getting effective characters. Now, uh, effects are a thing that I want to mention, but it is a very big topic, so I won't be able to cover it all. But generally speaking, for those of you guys who are curious, uh, our effects are mostly 2D, um, but they're not 2D in the way you ex it would expect. We have a couple of variations. We do have 2D cards that are just 2D. If you look at that dust effect there on the bottom right of that left image, that dust effect is just a plane with an image sequence on it that's been pre-drawn. That's pretty simple. That pink smear right there is actually grease pencil. So we use grease pencil as well. That's also 2D. And then we have the electric sparks on the head, which are actually a mesh with a 2D image sequence projected onto it in a sort of dome shape. So we get a little bit of 3D shape there. Um, on top of that, we also have a bunch of procedural animation that we do in the shaders to generate some noise and stuff like that to get a lot of like wind effects, uh, which has been, um, I mean, very satisfying to watch in my opinion. Uh, so huge props to the effects artists as well. And then we have Goo Blender, which I mentioned already. This is a big reason why we have a lot of the features that we do in that, first of all, Blender's open source, which is amazing. Um, and so we've been able to just take these uh, amazing foundational features and be like, we just need a little bit of extra stuff, a little bit of extra control in the shadows. So what we've done here is we have a shader info node. This actually breaks up the diffuse shader into four different passes. We have the diffuse shading, which is just the shading, no cast shadows, no self shadows. Then we also have the cast shadow separately, the self shadows, which are anything that's cast by itself onto itself, and then the ambient lighting. So this helps us actually a lot with character shading as well, but also with environments and other things. So having that extra control is incredibly important for getting the shadows that you want on an NPR character. And then we also have a couple other things. We have light groups. Light groups are an EV. Um, they are currently in cycles as well, but we put them in EV because we need them in EV. Um, this is something that we actually carried over from Blender Internal, because uh, Blender Internal did have light groups and I really enjoyed that. Um, and so I was like, we need that, so let's, let's get that in. Uh, and it's helped us have that extra control over, for example, having the face lit a little bit differently than the body, uh, or separating it even further. If you wanted to separate the hair or you wanted to separate the eyes, uh, you can group them differently and have t so much control over that, which is fantastic. We also have the curvature shader. So the curvature shader is something that we've added for environments. This is something that a lot of anime does. Specifically, uh, Makoto Shinkai is a, a huge culprit for this. Uh, he's the guy who did Your Name. You can see actually in the top right, that is a screenshot from the movie. And the bottom right-hand corner, we've attempted to recreate that in 3D entirely. Um, and so that is, of course, uh, basically a viewport render. And we have the curvature shader that is actually dynamically adjusting to uh, the camera angles and stuff like that, as well as to the geometry. Um, and by using that, we're able to recreate this sort of very simple effect, but something that's actually relatively difficult to do without it. For example, we tried using bevel modifiers. That got really heavy. This is something that is very simple to use and is now in our shader uh, editor. Um, if you're curious, technically the curvature shader is, works exactly the same way as the workbench one. We've simply ported it over to Eevee to give us that extra control. Um, here's the viewport with some dynamic lighting, which is one of the advantages of having a 3D scene. We can have different camera angles, different, uh, different lighting scenarios, all in the same file. This is another example of how the curvature shader works with a bit more of a dynamic sort of like angling. Um, you can kind of tell that the rim light, of course, is dynamic, and we also have uh, different parts of the cube curvature being highlighted depending on which angle you're seeing it from and stuff like that. This is another example of our environments. We have uh, uh, a lot of environments that we've made that we haven't shown off yet. So I wanted to have a couple examples of exactly sort of how detailed we can make them. And uh, this one also takes advantage of the curvature shader quite a bit. And we also have dynamic lighting. Um, and uh, it's really cool because this is a scene, for example, in one of the proje projects we're working on where we need a lot of different camera angles. Uh, and we're gonna be reusing it a lot. So for a 2D-esque production, 
having a 3D background is uh, a game changer because you don't have to redraw the backgrounds each time. And then we have this. So this, is, uh, this last slide is actually uh, a project that uh, we're still working on. And I wanted to show it to you guys because it's not finished yet. Uh, I know that the Emily project looked really good. I thought it looked really good. And this project is uh, uh, not going to look as good. <laughs> and I want you guys to know that we put in a lot of effort in these and, and sort of like what we have to fight. And you'll probably see some more similar things when you start working in NPR. A lot of things breaking when you have these work in progress uh, uh, projects. So I'm going to show you guys what this is. It's not supposed to look like this, but I hope you guys enjoy it anyway. Um, this is uh, a character named Alice, and she's waking up in a cyberpunk world. changing our thoughts, and they're getting closer and closer. So these Freddy Kruegers, I'm sorry, dream detectives, absolute nightmare fuel. If those are narrow implants no one knows anything about, yeah, the narrow still has any information about it, redacted. And Good morning, Alice. Classified. These people found dead last week, apparently covered in blood, with no trace of bullet wounds. What happened? Are we in danger with these Krugers on the case? We'll never know. Redacted. Just trust us. Come on, who could? Kruger's still out on the loose pretending they're only here to help us. They aren't helping people. They aren't here to solve crimes. They're a government-run PSYOPs division tasked with infiltrating our minds with whatever that Oneros implant really is. It might be too late. And if it is, we're not waking up from this nightmare. There you have it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that is uh, a project that we'll be finishing up next week. But uh, as you can see, it's got a little bit of work to do. Uh, the line art is a little weird and stuff like that, and the shading still needs some work. But in the meantime, as I finish up this talk, I want to remind you guys, if you guys weren't here in the last talk, Goo Blender is open source now. So if you guys want to download the source code, you can. It's right there. Um, and we also have a Patreon if you want to support further development of Goo Blender and further NPR features. Uh, someone's getting a call. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, there was only one slide left anyway, uh, which is basically just to say thank you very much for being here and watching the talk. I really appreciate it. Hope you guys learned something. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah.